So welcome to chapter nine. This is another pretty big chapter. We also have a lot of charts and tables that we're going to fill out as we work through this chapter. So as always, I'm going to really encourage you to have those notes printed if possible. Um, if not, at least have some paper and a pencil with you as we work through these. We're going to start by talking about property plant and equipment or plant assets. We first defined these back in chapter three and four, and so we'll be expounding on that definition. Remember, property, plant, and equipment, plant assets, capital assets are those long term assets or assets that have a long life. So that's one of our key parts of the definition. They are tangible, meaning we can touch them. They have a physical presence. They are used in the operations of the business. That's a really important part. We'll talk about some assets that possibly aren't used in the business. Like, for example, if we bought a piece of land as an investment, that's not plant assets. That would be an investment. So it has to be something that we're actually using. Now, a fourth part of the definition that's not technically a fourth part of the definition, but it's kind of implied is that these assets are somewhat expensive in nature. Um, the example that I, I always use is a trash can in an office. A trash can in an office is usually going to be used for more than a year, so it meets our definition of a long life. It's tangible, I can touch it, it's used, but it's not very expensive. So typically we would just call that an office supply and we would expense it when we do our adjusting entries for office supplies. But if we're talking about something that costs a lot of money, then we would call it a plant asset. So examples, uh, certainly lands, building, land, buildings, equipment, furniture, fixtures, automobiles, computers, anything like that meets our definition of a plant asset. Now, just like all assets, remember plant assets are recorded at their historical cost, which means the amount that we paid for them. Now, the cost principle, which is what we're following here, says that assets, all assets should be recorded at their actual cost, meaning what they actual, actually cost us. That includes everything that we have to pay to get these assets ready for their intended use. So if we have to pay sales tax, that gets included. If we have to pay commission, if we have to pay a setup fee, if we have to pay shipping, all of that gets included. We talked about this a little bit back in chapter five and six when we were talking about inventory and we said if we had to pay shipping or sales tax or stuff on the inventory, then we included that in the cost of the asset. We're going to do that at the same here as these plant assets. Now, one thing that I just wanted to point out, again, in the United States, we do not use fair value accounting for plant assets. We only use fair value accounting in some very specific circumstances that we don't really even get into in this class. However, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, does permit the uh, plant assets to be reported at their fair market value. So that's a, one of those big differences between GAAP and IFRS. So if we talk about land and land improvements, um, let's talk first about land. So when we buy a piece of land, everything we have to do to get that asset, that land ready for its intended use gets included in the cost of the land. So certainly that's the pr purchase price. If we have to pay survey, legal fees, title transfer fees, um, any broker's commissions, if we have to pay any delinquent property taxes, meaning back taxes. So what this means is, let's say that we're going to buy a land, and this is something that happened to me personally when my husband and I were buying our first house. We went to buy the house, we looked at it, we made an offer on it, um, the sellers accepted the offer, and then before we could close, the title company came back and said, okay, the current owners, the people that we were trying to buy it from, they had not paid their property taxes in several years. And so the county would not release the title to be transferred from the seller's name to our name until those back taxes were paid. So the sellers didn't have the money to pay those taxes. So we as the buyer agreed to pay those taxes if they dropped the, the purchase price by the same amount. So 
in our case, it was about $30,000. So they dropped the purchase price by $30,000 and we pay the $30,000 of back taxes. So in that case, I had to pay that in order to buy the property. That gets included as part of the cost of the land. Now, once I own the property, I have to pay property taxes every year. Those property taxes do not get included in the cost of the land. Okay. The other thing that I want to point out is example would be cost of clearing the land or doing something to the land to get it ready for use. So one of the examples in some of the in one of the homework problems that we see is grading the land. So let's say that I buy a piece of land and I'm wanting to build on it. Well, first I have to smooth it out. So I have to grade the land that gets included as part of the cost of the land. So I would debit the land account for all of these costs. Now remember, we talked about this a little bit back in chapter three, land does not get depreciated. Every other plant asset or property plant and equipment gets depreciated except for land. Land has an indefinite useful life. We're never going to use it completely up, so it does not get depreciated. Now, land improvements though do get depreciated. These are things that we put on the land that do have a limited life. So once we've bought the land, then we decide, hey, I need to put in a parking lot and I need to put some fences and I'm gonna do a sprinkler system and put some signs up. All of those are called land improvements. They go into a separate account because these will be depreciated, but the land will not. So let's look at an example. Here we're told we purchased land on August 1st for $50,000 with a note payable. Other that was the purchase price of the land. Other costs included 4,000 in delinquent property taxes, 2,000 in transfer taxes, that's to transfer the title, and 5,000 to remove an old building and 1,000 for the survey. So our first question is, what is the cost of the land? Well, in this case, we would include the purchase price of 50 plus the back taxes of four plus the transfer taxes plus the building to remove it plus the survey fee so if I did my math right I think that's $62,000 so I want to debit the land account for the total of $62,000 so when we look at the journal entry, notice we debit the land account for the 62, we credited notes payable for cash for 50 and cash for 12. Now, the debiting of the land account for 62 is called capitalizing, and that's capital with an A-L, not an O-L. When we capitalize an asset, that means we are debiting the asset account as opposed to debiting an expense account. So when we talk about expenditures, we'll say these are a capital expenditure, which means they get debited to an asset or it's just a regular expense, in which case we'll debit it to an expense. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a minute. So then we're told that we paid an additional 20,000 for fences, paving, lighting, and signs. Now these are also capitalized, but they will be capitalized to the land improvements account, and then the cash account would be credited. So the 62,000 in the land account will not be depreciated, but the 20,000 in the land improvements account will be depreciated. All right, so if we have a building or we're buying a building, there's two different scenarios here. One is we are constructing a building. So we've bought that land and we're going to build our own building on top of it. When we are building our own building, the capitalized fees would include the architect fees, uh, the building permits, of course, the contractor charges and all the materials, the labor and everything else that we have to pay. All of that gets in, gets capitalized would get debited to the building account now if we buy a building that is already standing it's already there then we would include the purchase price and 
of course, any of the closing fees also. So the uh, inspection, the survey, the title transfer fees, just like we did with the land, would also all get capitalized. But in addition to that, anything that we need to do to renovate the building before we can move in and start using it. So if we buy this building, but we're like, okay, well, before I can start using it, I need to have the carpet replaced. I need to have some work, the air conditioners replaced. I'm going to have to have the whole thing repainted. All of that that I do before I start using the building gets capitalized. Now, once I'm using the building and I decide, oh, hey, the air conditioner broke, I need to fix that. That's not a capital expenditure. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So it's everything you have to do to get the ready, ready, the building ready to use the first time. You're buying some machinery and equipment. It would be the purchase price, less any discounts. If you had to pay for shipping, if you paid for insurance while it was in transit, if you paid any sales taxes, purchase commission, if you had to pay someone to come set it up, if you had to pay to have it tested, all of those get capitalized. Now, for furniture and fixtures, these we typically include desks, chairs, filing cabinets, office furniture, computers, things like that. Of course, it's everything, the purchase price, the sales tax, the shipping, the installation, anything like that that, again, you have to pay to get ready to use, get it ready to use. Now, let's look at an example where we have what we call a lump sum purchase. So oftentimes when we buy a piece of property, we're buying the land and the building in one lump sum. But I need to record them into two separate accounts because the building will be depreciated, but the land will not be, although I bought them in one purchase for one purchase price. So we're going to have to figure out how to separate those two using what's called the relative market value method. So anytime that you buy, I don't know if you've bought a house or something before, but anytime you buy, a, let's just use the example of a house. So we bought our house and we bought the piece of land that it sits on. We had to have it appraised by the bank. The bank wanted an appraisal before they would give us a loan. They want to make sure that what we're buying is approximately what it's worth. So when the appraisers come, they will appraise the land and the building as if they were two separate assets, which they are, even though I'm buying them in one transaction. So in this example, we're told Smart Touch Learning is paying $100,000 for a land and building. Now, when the appraiser came, they appraised it at the market value of the land by itself is 30,000 and the building as 90,000. So notice that the total appraised value is 120, but we're only buying it for one. So since the total appraised value is 120, I'm going to take the relative market value to determine the capitalized cost of each asset. So for example, the land was worth 30,000 out of a total of 120. So that's 25%. The building is worth 90,000 out of a total of 120. So that's 75%. So then I'm going to apply those percentage percentages to my purchase price of 100,000. So since the land is worth 25% of the total and I paid 100,000, I'm going to record the land at 25,000. Since the building was worth 75% of the total and I paid 100,000, I'm going to record the building at 75,000. So now when I do the journal entry to record this, I'm going to debit two assets, the land for 25, the building for 75, and then I'll credit note payable for the total of 100. Now, this is what we were talking about, our expenditures. So everything that we have to pay before we start using any of these assets gets capitalized, okay? But once we've started using the asset, we're going to run into some expenditures. And some of those are what we call capital expenditures, meaning they get debited to the asset account. And some of those are what we call revenue expenditures. Now, don't let this title confuse you. Revenue expenditures means that we're going to debit an expense account. 
whereas capital expenditures means that we're going to debit an asset. Okay, so in order for something to be a capital expenditure, it has to either increase the asset's capacity or efficiency or extend the asset's useful life, okay? Um, this would include what we consider extraordinary repairs. Now, here's a good rule of thumb. If this is something that is going to happen more than once over the asset's useful life, it is not a capital expenditure. So if we take a car, for example, you're going to have to change the oil on that car regularly. Now, yes, I know that changing the oil regularly increases the, the asset's useful life. But since you have to do that more than once, that's a revenue expenditure, not a capital expenditure. You have to replace the tires on a car more than once. That's a revenue expenditure, not a capital expenditure. So a capital expenditure would be something completely out of the ordinary life. Like you had to have the engine completely rebuilt, okay? If we're talking about a building, having the air conditioner repaired, not a capital expenditure. But let's say you decided to turn your um, garage into a home theater. Now you've increased the livable capacity of your building. Therefore, you've, that's a capital expenditure. So again, a good rule of thumb is if it's going to, if it's something that could happen more than once, it's a revenue expenditure, not a capital expenditure. If it's something that's only going to happen once, then it would be a capital expenditure. 